Mountain Falls. Located about 10 miles west of Colorado Springs, this will be our home base for the next few days. At an altitude of 7,800 feet, the town is nearly hidden in a beautiful mountain valley. Green Mountain Falls was settled as a tourist town in the 1880s and boasts a population of 646 in the 2020 census. With a man-made lake featuring the Lake Gazebo, a post office, and three restaurants, a handful of hotels and vacation rentals are available. Our first stop is Cave of the Winds near Manitou Springs. The name, Cave of the Winds, relates to a legend involving the Apache, who were said to believe the cave was the home of a great spirit of the wind. All right, we've got everybody. Yep. Awesome folks. So, first of all, take a second to catch your breath. In 1880, brothers George and John Pickett discovered the cave while hiking. Legend has it that their candles flickered mysteriously in the wind blowing from a nearby crevice. This signaled them to explore further, and when they crawled through the limestone archway, they discovered a large chamber unlike anything they had seen before. When we were digging it out, we made a big old mistake. Way up there, we poked a hole in the wall, accidentally rediscovering the Manitou Grand Caverns. The Manitou Grands were an old rival tourist cave of ours, in operation from about 1885 to 1916. The Manitou Grands had no improved flooring and no electric lights, and it is where we conduct our haunted lantern tours. Exploration of the Cave of the Winds was further opened up by an Ohio stonecutter named George Washington Snyder, who came to Colorado seeking his fame and fortune. Late in 1880, Snyder excavated several passages of the stunning Williams Canyon Caves and uncovered Canopy Hall, filled with thousands of stalactites and stalagmites. In all of its beauty, Snyder said it was as though Aladdin with his wonderful lamp had affected the magic result. This is the highest point on our cave tour today. We are over 7,000 feet in elevation, which is halfway up Pikes Peak if you're measuring from sea level. Congratulations on making it, everyone. After discovering the massive caves, he continued to excavate and began to offer guided tours in 1881. The Cave of the Winds quickly became one of the established attractions of the Young Manitou Resort area. Electricity was brought into parts of the caves in July 1907, making it even easier to tour the caves. Of course, every cave tour includes turning off the electric lights so you can experience total darkness. Operations have continued at Cave of the Winds since 1881, making it one of Colorado's oldest and most famous attractions. Now, enjoy these professional photographs provided by Cave of the Winds.
Our next stop is the Garden of the Gods. The human history of the garden commences many centuries before our present time. Stone hearths and fire rings found in the garden dating over 3,000 years ago indicate the presence of early inhabitants. The Utes oral tradition tell of their creation at the Garden of the Gods, and petroglyphs have been found in the park that are typical of early Utes. The Old Ute Trail went past Garden of the Gods to Ute Pass and led later explorers through Manitou Springs. Modern history of the gardens begins in 1858 when gold was discovered along the Front Range and in South Park, northwest of Colorado Springs. Thousands of prospectors and settlers flocked to the area, including a party from Lawrence, Kansas, who camped along the stream known as Camp Creek and carved their names on the sandstone boulder now called Signature Rock. In 1859, the gardens were named by two surveyors who were laying out the town of Colorado City. As they were riding their horses through the garden, Melanchthon Beach remarked the park would be a capital place for a beer garden. Rufus Cable replied, Beer garden? Why, it is a place fit for the gods to assemble. We will call it Garden of the Gods. We rejoin our intrepid climbers as they prepare their descent. Ladies first, Jill. Nice and easy. That does it. Now it's Jack's turn. Cowabunga, Jack. The city of Colorado Springs was founded in 1871 by General William Jackson Palmer, founder of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. In 1879, General Palmer talked a fellow railroad man, Charles Elliott Perkins, into buying 240 acres of the Central Garden for a summer home. Perkins later added another 240 acres. However, he never built on the land, but always kept it open to the public. It became Mr. Perkins' wish to give the land to the city of Colorado Springs for a park, but he died before making these wishes known in a will. However, his six children honored his wishes, and on Christmas Day of 1909, the 480 acres were conveyed to the city with the provision that it would always remain free to the public. Next, we make a quick stop at the Ghost Town Museum. In 1858, the cry, Pike's Peak or Bust, opened the Colorado Territory to the gold prospector. As miners quickly populated the western frontier of the United States, they needed transportation. Before long, the twin steel ribbons of the railroad pushed into the Colorado mountains. Towns sprang up overnight, and by the 1860s, people filled the West. Small encampments became small towns, and small cities along the front range of the Rocky Mountains provided a central location for supplies and services. 
it was a rough and tumble time. Once the mines were emptied of their treasure, many towns were abandoned to become ghost towns. And by the time gold was discovered in Cripple Creek in 1891, the spirit of the frontier was almost gone. Opened in 1954, and now in its third generation of family operations, Ghost Town Museum evolved from a desire to preserve this era for generations to come. The town is an indoor collection of the very structures that were left to decay around the Pikes Peak region, all looking much as they would have 100 years ago. An impressive array of everyday artifacts is displayed in each building. The museum itself is housed inside an historic stone structure. In 1899, the Colorado Midland Railroad constructed it as a maintenance building for the steam locomotives that hauled gold ore to the Golden Cycle Mill, once located across the street from the museum. The roundhouse next door and the Ghost Town Museum are all that remain of operations of the Golden Cycle Company, which closed facilities in 1949. There's far more to mining than digging giant holes or finding pretty gems, which is what you'll quickly discover when you visit the Western Museum of Mining and Industry. Open since 1970, the museum is committed to preserving and interpreting the rich mining history of Colorado and the American West. Nobody knows who made the first discovery of gold in Colorado. The earliest record dates to the 1760s, when the Spanish explorer Juan Maria de Rivera led a party into the San Juan Mountains, searching for a non-desert route from Santa Fe to California. In January 1848, James Marshall discovered gold at Sutter's Mill and touched off the California Gold Rush. It drew thousands of people from all over the world and set in motion the search for gold throughout the entire American West. Throughout the 1850s, Argonauts bound for California made an uncounted number of gold discoveries along Cherry Creek and the South Platte River. William Green Russell put together a prospecting party to make a systematic search for the metal. Augmented by a group of Cherokees led by John Beckby, they arrived on Cherry Creek in 1858. They found inconsequential signs of gold here and there, but eventually, as they traced the stream north and west, they found a substantial deposit of placer gold at the stream's junction with the South Platte River. It was this discovery that touched off the Pikes Peak Gold Rush in 1858. I need a volunteer, someone who knows how to operate one of these little cigarette lighters. Isaac, can you get it running? Thank you. Yep. So anyhow, that's about the amount of light that a carbide light puts out. Mm -hmm. Now this is a big one. This one will burn for about 12 hours. And that flame tells you things. If the flame gets really long, then you're in an atmosphere that may be methane gas. Mm -hmm. If it gets really, really tiny, you're in an oxygen poor environment. Now the miners used a smaller version of that, like this one. This would burn for about six hours. When it went out, it told you it was lunchtime. So you go to that red can on the floor, and you fill your uh, lamp up with calcium carbide, add water, get the light going, sat down and had lunch. Now you took part of your lunch and you threw it on the floor. That's because you believed in something called Tommy Knockers. Mm. Now a Tommy Knocker is a ghost. And it was a good ghost, because if you heard, that might mean that you missed the vein of gold. Or maybe this timber is about to crack and break. Or maybe the rocks are fracturing on you. So you took good care of the Tommy knockers and you fed them lunch. And of course the food disappeared. Do you guys know why? The birds. Rats. 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 
mice or any kind of critter. The Pikes Peak Gold Rush brought unprecedented numbers of people into the region, and that in turn led to powerful social, economic, and political changes that brought about the creation of Colorado Territory in 1861, culminating in the admittance of Colorado to the Union in 1876. Mining, in all its phases, remained the great engine of the Colorado economy until the early 20th century. Mineral development in the Centennial State both reflected and contributed to the dramatic industrial and technological advances of the late 19th and 20th centuries. The Colorado Springs Pioneer Museum is located downtown in the restored 1903 El Paso County Courthouse. The museum preserves the history and culture of the Pikes Peak region through exhibits such as The Story of Us, the Pikes Peak region from A to Z. Interactive maps allow you to open a letter from A to Z and learn about the people, places, and events that make the region unique. Navigate dynamic maps that allow you to go back in time to understand how neighborhoods, businesses, climate, and transportation have shaped the community. Twenty twenty one marked the sesquicentennial anniversary of the founding of Colorado Springs, and the anniversary presents a unique opportunity to reflect on the past, consider the present, and contemplate the future in the Cause at 150 exhibit. It was understood that one gallery, one exhibit, or even one book could not tell the complete story. Instead, they have chosen to examine 150 objects, illuminating 150 stories exploring 150 years. The stories in the gallery are organized chronologically, roughly 10 per decade, but not one per year. Short descriptions accompany the objects, and visitors are invited to open the QR codes to explore further. 
Although the path is chronological from 1871 to the present, there is no right or wrong way to move through the gallery. During the 1930s and 50s, the Conejos neighborhood was made up of a few dozen tight-knit families who described themselves as una familia grande. For over a century, the four-block-long Conejos neighborhood was home to generations of working-class families. Through a community-based storytelling approach, neighbors share their own memories, allowing visitors to gain insight into the Conejos neighborhood's unique community identity, history, and culture. Helen Hunt Jackson was a famous 19th century American author whose 12 years in Colorado Springs were the most productive of her career. She arrived in 1873, an invalid in search of health. In Colorado Springs, she built a new life and discovered the cause she championed until her death in 1885. She worked feverishly as an advocate for American Indian rights in an era when it was unpopular to do so. Pushed out by repressive Jim Crow laws, acts of violence and intimidation, and economic and political repression, blacks moved any place that was north and west. This exhibit explores what they found when they arrived in Colorado Springs, the supportive community they created for themselves, and the role they played in shaping the city. From its founding in 1871, Local boosters advertised Colorado Springs as a premier health destination for the treatment of tuberculosis. The region's greatest asset turned industry was its stunning scenery, abundant sunshine, and mild climate. In the early 20th century, over 15 institutions in the Pikes Peak region offered care and treatment to tubercular patients at any one time. The largest institutions housed hundreds of patients, while the smallest cared for only a handful. Essentially, patients could find all the care they could afford. The Penrose Heritage Museum was founded in 2005 and showcases the history and heritage of the Pikes Peak region through the personal artifact collection of Colorado Springs philanthropists Spencer and Julie Penrose. The Penrose legacy includes the construction of the Pikes Peak Auto Highway in 1916, Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, the Broadmoor Hotel, the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College, Will Rogers Shrine of the Sun, and Pikes Peak or Bust Rodeo, just to name a few of Colorado Springs' most iconic attractions.
Penrose Heritage Museum exhibits 30 carriages, personal artifacts of Spencer and Julie Penrose, and 15 race cars that competed in the famous Race to the Clouds, one of the oldest motorsports events in the U.S., second only to the Indianapolis 500. Construction of Miramont Castle began in 1895. Father John Baptiste Francolin had collected architectural ideas from his early years of traveling the world with his diplomat father and served as his own architect. The Gillis brothers, Angus and Archie, were contractors at the castle, and according to a daughter of Angus Gillis, Father Francolin sat at the table in the Gillis home for countless hours while his plans were described in detail for the builders. William Frizzell, like the Gillis brothers, came from Nova Scotia. He and his sons had cleared land for horses, built roads, and constructed the stone arch bridges over Ruxton and Fountain Creeks. They quarried and hand cut the native green sandstone for Miramont's two foot thick walls. Miramont, which means look at the mountain, had indoor plumbing and electricity when it was built, as electricity had become available in the late 1880s when Angus Gillis built El Paso County's first electric generator in Manitou for Dr. Isaac Bell. With Father Francolin incorporating all the features he liked into the castle, a remarkable structure with nine separate styles of architecture emerged. From the medieval, crenellated battlements at each end of the castle, to the beautiful Gothic front door, Miramont stood as a tribute to one man's dream. Shingle-style Queen Anne, Romanesque, English Tudor, Flemish stepped gables, domestic Elizabethan, Venetian ogee, Byzantine, Moorish, and half-timber chateau are used randomly throughout the four stories. For example, the grand staircase has two sets of windows, each in a different architectural style. With the building stair-stepping up the mountain, the front door is on the first level and the back door is on the fourth. All four floors had at least one exit to level ground. Miramont is over 14,000 square feet, has over 40 rooms, including eight-sided rooms, a 16-sided room, a solarium, which was once a conservatory greenhouse, arched doors and windows, with rarely a room with four square corners. In 1904, the Sisters of Mercy purchased the then vacant castle, turning it into a sanatorium until 1927 when it transitioned to a retreat and vacation home for the sisters. In 1946, the sisters sold the building to private investors who subdivided it into nine apartments. The Manitou Springs Historical Society purchased the castle in 1976, saving it from condemnation 
and beginning the thousands of hours of volunteer work restoring the castle where work continues to this day. The Manitou Cliff Dwellings The 40-room site was originally located near McElmo Canyon in the southwest corner of Colorado. The process of relocating these cliff dwellings began in 1904 and was completed in 1907 when the preserve was open to the public. Virginia McClurg, the original founder of the Colorado Cliff Dwellers Association, hired William Crosby and the Manitou Cliff Dwellings Ruins Company to begin this process. They wanted to preserve and protect the ancestral Pueblan architecture from looters and relic pot hunters. They began a preservation project and acquired the rights to move a portion of the dwellings from the McElmo Canyon area to Phantom Canyon, later to be renamed Cliff Canyon in Manitou Springs. Over a several year period, the stones were collected, packaged, and finally moved by oxen to Dolores, Colorado. There they were loaded and shipped by railroad to Colorado Springs, and finally brought to Cliff Canyon by horse and wagon. Crosby's men then faithfully reassembled the dwellings in dimension and appearance to those in the Four Corners region. They used a concrete mortar in 1907, as opposed to the adobe mud clay mortar the cliff dwellers used. This preservation process allows individuals to walk inside and tour through the dwellings. The creation of the Manitou Cliff Dwellings Museum and Preserve was the vision of Virginia McClurg and Harold Ashenhurst. It was undertaken to create a museum that preserves and protects the fine stonework architecture of the cliff dwellers, which at that time were unprotected from vandals and artifact hunters. Pikes Peak, which is proudly listed as a National Historic Landmark, was once home to the Ute Indians and, even earlier, to the Clovis culture. Back in the time of the region's first peoples, the mountain was referred to in many different ways, including Sun Mountain, Sun Mountain Sitting Big, and Long Mountain. The Spanish explorers who came to the region referred to the mountain as El Capitan. In 1806, many different exploration parties were sent out into the territories to explore the country by President Thomas Jefferson. One of those parties was led by Zebuon Pike. Pike and his party discovered the mountain in the early fall, referring to it as Grand Peak. Unfortunately for Pike and company, it gets rather cold in the Rockies and the team's unfortunate decision to attempt to summit the mountain in November resulted in a mission failure. Pike's Peak would not be summited successfully on record until 1820, when naturalist Edwin James climbed it in much more pleasant weather. For a brief time, the peak would be named after James. Ultimately, though, Pike's legacy endured. After settlers came into the Pikes Peak region, it wasn't uncommon for them to ascend the peak by foot or by burrow. A road of sorts was built in 1887, allowing a much more pleasant way to travel up the summit. In 1890, another option came into play as the Cog Railway began to be laid. Today, Pikes Peak can be ascended via the Pikes Peak Highway or Bar Trail if you want to hike it. A popular third route remains the Cog Railroad. The mountain is home to a recreation area with three lakes, hiking trails, mountain biking trails, and the Summit House, where visitors can enjoy a hot, fresh donut with a view. Pikes Peak is also home to the Pikes Peak Marathon and Ascent, the Pikes Peak Hill Climb, and the Pikes Peak Cycling Hill Climb. Hundreds of thousands of people travel to the peak year-round 
to ascend by vehicle or on foot, making it one of the most accessible mountains in the world.